Well, welcome everybody. This is a talk that I'm giving about human papillomavirus. And my goal really is to destigmatize STIs. STIs are, you know, part of those reasons that we're so scared of engaging with other people. In school, we're often given a lot of scary pictures or ugly pictures of what STIs look like. So they're really embedded in our consciousness is something that we need to be scared and worried about. And we tend to be more scared and worried about STIs than other viruses such as chicken pox or the common cold. And really up until the past 12 months when we've had COVID, uh, STIs are probably the most feared of all infections. So today I'm going to give uh, the one on, on human papillomavirus, and really it is pro it is the most common uh, virus and the most common of all the of all the STIs out there. So it's so common that almost everybody who is sexually active will get it at some point of their lives. And who am I? So my name is Evelyn Dacker and I am a board certified family physician and I own my own practice called Vita Integrative Medicine in Salem, Oregon. I've been practicing for almost 30 years and practice the full scope of medicine. So I delivered babies, I've held hands, people in hospice. And so I really get to see the full breadth of life and it gives me a great perspective on what it is like to be human. I'm also a consent educator. I created a Saver Sex talk, which is a framework to have conversations. And I am going to talk about it at the end of this, of this slideshow, because I believe that that's one of the ways that we can actually help destigmatize um, STIs. I'm also a community leader. I was the executive director of Sex Positive Portland um, from 2018 up until last year when the pand pandemic started. And so my objectives for this talk, I, I kind of wanted to, I don't know, I came up with a silly thing with, the, with these apps. So at HPV facts, our fears, our fallacies, and the future. And fallacies probably doesn't fit, but whatever, it worked in my apps. So it is what it is. And as I, for anybody who's come in, this is a very de um, dense slideshow, so I will be sending them to everybody so you don't have to take notes. I do want to do a language disclaimer because with, with HPV more than other uh, um, STIs, it's very gendered and all of the language that's used in the research is always like woman, female, male, man. And it's, I, I prefer using anatomy and cervixes, uterus, penises. But sometimes here, because I'm, I'm quoting research studies, we do use a lot of male, female, man, all the gender language, so please forgive me. Um, when they say woman and female, it reflects anatomical parts, which include vulva, vaginal canal, cervix, and uterus. And man reflects anatomical parts, which include testes and penis. We know that there are men who have canals and cervixes and uteruses and you know, women that have penises. So please um, just understand that I'm just kind of taking from the literature. And unfortunately, medicine is very gendered. It's very cisgender focused. It, there's a race, racist quality in medicine. It's all, it's all the things, it's all the intersectional isms that you can think of. And slowly we are breaking that down. Uh, when it says MSM, that identifies people who have penises having sexual, sexual contact with people with penises. So, and you know what? I don't think that I'm actually. Okay, I'm not sure if this is actually. Um, hold on, give me, I just want to check that it's recording. Okay. Okay, so I'm just gonna go through a little bit. I'm gonna go through the facts. HPV is the common cold of STIs. Almost everybody's gonna get it at some point of their life. The fears, we have fears around it because we have shame around having sex and having more than one partner. In fact, in the CDC, multiple partners actually means more than four partners in a lifetime. Of course, no one wants warts on their genitals. Nobody wants cancer. And it's a silent infection that could be transmitted unknowingly. The fallacies is that it only affects women. People think, oh, it's only a disease of the cervix. That testing, if one does testing on a yearly basis or just a specific um, HPV testing, that then we're gonna be able to get on top of it. 
that testing of people with penises is only it's done because of sexism and that's the reason we don't test penises and that well there's no really reason to disclose because everybody has it and that condoms actually protect you they protect a bit not all the future is that we can prevent it there's a there is a vaccination we could keep our immune system healthy. We could understand risk tolerance and we could reduce transmission through communication. So a little bit about what is a virus because viruses are really fascinating because they're kind of like parasites, but they're not alive. I think of them as robots and they come in to the cell. They kind of infect the actual cell. It takes over the DNA and then it takes over the cell. It breaks the cell apart and, it and then it just replicates. And that's how it multiplies and spreads. So one of the things that we know that stops a virus is by having a healthy immune system. When we see HPV, there's about a, over 100 to 150 types of HPV. 30 of them are, are sexually transmissible, transmissible. And then we break that down to low risk, which are genital warts, some benign cervical changes, and then the high risk ones, which are associated with cancer. As you can see here below, HPV is associated with more than just cervical cancer, also anal, vulvar, vaginal, penile, and throat cancers. So in 2018, 43 million infections occurred. And of course, this is just people who are being tested. And the people who are being tested are mostly women. Um, they also test on the biopsies of throat cancer. So some of those are included in this number. And there's about 13 million new infections. So it's out there. It's really, really common. Um, here are the kinds of the low risk types that affect the genital and mucus. And then before the HPV, it was really thought about like, almost one in every hundred sexually active adults were gonna get at least this low grade and, and have warts. Warts was much more common before the, um, the beginning of using the vaccine. Then we all know that there's the other kind of warts. The warts on our hands, on our feet, some skin tags, those are HPV. And sometimes, you know, as you get older, you start seeing more skin tags. That's because our immune system isn't quite as strong as it was when it was younger. So these skin tags kind of show up and they are an HPV uh, virus. Okay, let me keep up here. Uh, talk a little bit about cervical cancer. And I'm not going to go into treatment of abnormal pap smears as a whole other discussion. I'm just really gonna stay on HPV. So there's the initial infection and a lot of cervical cancers, they go back and persist persistent infection and go back to just clearing it. You could actually go to almost a real cancer precursor and then go back to clearing it. So, ah, I didn't mean to go down. So cervical cancer does happen, but really it's rare that persistent HPV infections proceed to all the way to there. So, um, they, there's like a 12 to 30% that they'll proceed here, but then on to cervical cancer, it's even less. I don't have the number in my brain right now though. So 70% of cervical cancer are caused by HPV 16 and 18. Those are the ones that we're the most concerned about. And HPV, um, eight, both of these are also linked to throat cancer. So other HPV associated cancers are anal and 91% of anal cancers are uh, from HPV. It does not mean that you have to have anal sex to get anal cancer though. That's a fallacy that you can actually get anal cancer from having HPV in your, in your vulva, in your cervix. Um, and then it just kind of spreads to your anus. In fact, more cases are among women than among men, but men who, people with penises who have sex with people with penises do actually have a higher risk of anal cancer. Then there's a the throat cancer. <coughs> and the, the most, 70% um, of all of the throat cancers are now caused by, I think it's, that should be HPV 18 and not 13. Um, Throat cancers are now the most common HPV associated cancer. They've surpassed cervical cancer. It's more common amongst men and it, smoking and alcohol use increase it. 
the transmission is thought to be through oral sex. I hate to tell you that. I was really hoping that wasn't the case. I was like, hmm, but it is. But the wonderful thing is that it's really, the, the outcomes are excellent. Uh, the survival rate is 85 to 90 percent, and that's much higher than or than throat cancers that are not HPV related. Okay, so this is a big question I often get is like, how do I know? How long does it take? What happens? And this is a little bit of a busy slide, but I'll try to kind of explain it. So you get exposed to the to the virus. It could take weeks to years after the exposure to have it infect the skin cells. So that means it could, the skin cells of outside that could cause genital warts or the skin cells inside of the cervix. So the average length of new cervical infections could last for about eight months. If it's an external HPV infection and you end up with genital warts, they usually take three, to, like three weeks to a few months to show up. And they clear pretty fast. Most people clear them within a year to two years. So if you have warts, usually that means that the exposure was like not years away, but probably closer to when, when they showed up. And it does clear pretty fast. And it clears a lot, about a quarter percent faster than the high risk HPV that infects the cervix. So some people clear it right away. And the way you clear it is really through your immune system being healthy. And once you clear it, it can't, while the, cell, the virus can persist, so there's no cure for it, usually it goes away. Like it'll not show up ever again. If it comes back, so if somebody was to have an abnormal pap smear and show up with that HPV when they're 30, and then all of a sudden at 45, they get it again, it's probably a new infection. They probably were reinfected. But there are a few people, a very, it's a very rare that some people have persistent infection and they could take months to years to proceed to this, um, these precursors, these cancer precursors. It takes about five to six years to get from persistent infection to cancer. And that is the reason we don't do PAP testing and HPV testing every single year anymore. Okay, does anyone have questions about this? I don't see any in the chat and I don't see anybody speaking up. Okay, I will go on. Okay, so that was kind of like my facts of HPV. So as I say, 70% of new infections clear within a year and the full 90% of infections clear within two years. And most people never know they have it. And when I talk about people, I talk about men because unless they get genital warts, they don't know they have it. And when I talk about people, I talk about people with cervixes because if they're not getting uh, regular pap smears and testing and they won't know they have it. And we actually don't start testing for HPV until you're 30 years old. I'll talk about that. So if it clears, so there's no risk of transmission, correct. When it clears, um, there is no risk of transmission of that particular virus. So let's say you had uh, HPV 16 and then it cleared. That doesn't mean that you could, you could get HPV sometime later in the future or another HP, one of the hundred other strains you can get. So for most people, HPV is a harmless infection. It does not result in visible symptoms or in health complications. Really only very few people get cervical cancer or throat cancer. In fact, cervical cancer is much more of a worldwide disease than it is a, a cancer that's killing women here in the United States. So for comparison, I did this. So, you know, look how many more people die in a car and yet how many times when we get in a car do we think, oh my God, the risk is just too high to get into the car? You are much, much, much more likely to die from a car accident than you would from cervical cancer. Also lung cancer, and the reason I chose lung cancer is because we know that lung cancer is caused by smoking. And yet people 
continue to smoke all the time. There's all these new people smoking, people, uh, you know, are vaping. So when we talk about the fear over HPV, we have, it's really important to keep it in context of the fears of everything else that we, we encounter in life and all the risks we take. And we'll talk a little bit more about risk tolerance later on. So HPV is a ghost that in men's bodies, because we don't know it's there, that shows up in women's bodies. Um, I would say it's the ghost in penises that shows up in cervixes. Uh, I did not do that code. And that is kind of true, but not always. Um, since only people with cervixes could be tested, it definitely reinforces it that HPV is a woman's STI. But truly, there are more people with penises that have, that are carrying HPV high risk HPV than there are people with cervixes. That 25% of men in the United States, and this was from a study from 2013 to 2014, had HPV, whereas the rate of them having the vaccine was much less. Also, people with penises tend to have that same rate of HPV their whole life. So they, that's the same rate of 25, 25% when they're 20 and 25% when they're 60. Whereas people with cervixes, it actually, it, it, the highest is the age of 20 to 24. And after the age of 24, HPV starts clearing and goes down. By the time that a person is 59, the, the chances of having an HPV is less, is less than 10%. And so we say, okay, why don't we, we need to test? What is the testing? So the testing, oh, is there any questions before I go into testing? Just keep popping them up with Dale, right? Okay, so testing in women, the HPV test, HPV was discovered as the cause of cervical cancer only in 1983, which happened to be my favorite year because I was young and got to, 80s were great to be a teenager, I'll tell you that, especially in New York, but that's besides the point. So um, it was only discovered before that they actually thought it was herpes. They thought that uh, herpes was the cause of cervical cancer. So they found the test for cervical cancer in 1998, and then routine testing of HPV only started in 2003, so in the United States, which is not that long ago. So we don't actually start testing HPV until a person is 30 years old, and I'll get to that. You do a PAP only. We start PAPs at age 21, and now you only do them every three years through the age of 29. And why we're doing that, a PAP is a specific test where we only look at the cells of the cervix. And if somebody has a mild abnormality of those cells of the cervix and they're less than 29, we pretty much think, okay, you're gonna clear this infection. There's a lot of HPV that's really in that population and telling somebody or finding out they have HPV does not change anything. We just say, okay, you're gonna clear it. But instead of waiting five years, we're gonna check again in, in three. And um, if there's no abnormalities in the cells then it's not really an issue because again it's it doesn't do anything and 90 percent of those clear so if there are abnormalities then we do do that hpv testing and we do further evaluation of the cervix like a colposcopy which is just binoculars on a stand where we look at the cervix really close up and put a little bit of vinegar and it looks at abnormal cells so it's rare. I do pap smears. I do maybe about five pap smears every single week because we don't do as many as we used to. And it's very, very rare that I find any abnormalities of significance in this age group. It happens, but it's rare. So then at age 30 is when we start doing the co-testing. So we do the pap smear, we look at the, cell, the cells on the cervix, and then we actually, they also do an additional test to see if HPV is present. Most of the time, they just see if HPV, if any of the, I think there's 37 that they, or 30 that they look at. And then if they're present, we tend to do a high risk one to see if 16 and 18 are present, because that changes the management of what we do. If the cells on the cervix look great, all we do is repeat the test in a year. So that's when we do HPVs and PAPs on a yearly basis, only if there's abnormalities. 
if there's not an abnormality, we don't need to test all the time because if there's going to be a precursor to cervical cancer, we're going to find it within those. It's so slow that we'll find it way before it becomes cervical cancer. In the 30 years that I have been a physician, I have diagnosed two cases of cervical cancer and I've done thousands of pap tests. The two cases, one was with a woman who was in her 70s who never had a pap smear in her life. And the other one was a 40 um, a year old woman who was coming from Mexico who also never had a pap smear in her life. Pretty much cervical cancer is very treatable because we find it before it becomes cancer. We find it when it's just the, in that pre-cancerous stage and we can get rid of those cells in that pre-cancerous stage so that then new cells grow. Hopefully those cells no longer will have that HPV unless it gets re-exposed with HPV and a person could go on living a very happy life. So what happens after a colposcopy? Well, it kind of depends. It kind of depends on what we find. So if we find just mild changes, oftentimes we just watch it and we repeat it after a year, a pap smear and HB after a year. If there's more significant changes, we can freeze the cells of the cervix because when we freeze it, it causes those cells to die off and new cells to grow. And then hopefully, you know, and that kills off all the HPV infected cells. If it's more advanced, like CIN3, then they do something called a LEAP procedure, and it's electrocautery where they actually cut a part of the cervix out, and then new cells grow. One of the reasons that we don't do HPV testing and on people less than 29 is because before when we'd see these changes, instead of waiting for it to clear on its own, people would do these, these procedures and do more um, invasive procedures on young women, which then might reduce their ability to have a healthy pregnancy. Because sometimes when you cut too much of the cervix, it causes a laxity in the cervix and it's hard to maintain a pregnancy to full term. So after these procedures, is the virus cleared? Yes, because you get rid of the cells where they're infected. You get rid of the actual cells that the HPV is in. So the virus is cleared. Testing in men, uh, what if they're in the throat? Okay, well, we're gonna talk about men and, and what to do there. So there's no routine HPV testing. The reason is because the results are just inconsistent. How do you, it's hard to get those samples off the thick skin of a penis and you'd have to probably do the entire penis. Um, there's no treatment option. So what if they come back positive? What do you do? There's nothing you can do, you just wait for it to clear. The virus is invisible and other than genital warts, there are no symptoms. If a person does have genital warts, if there are genital warts, there are treatment for that. There's topical medicine that could be applied at home and there's freezing and in very bad, in very significant cases, you can actually burn them off. Testing for the throat is done on the biopsied specimen, which means that when they find the throat cancer and they take it out, then that is when they actually uh, do the test and see if it's HPV. And the reason they do that is because the treatment options are different if it's HPV versus if it's not an HPV related throat cancer. There, I, I did see that there's some new um, studies coming out on saliva testing where people could you know, spit and do the saliva testing and that's a way of testing for HPV in the throat for men. But really that's probably gonna only apply to people with throat cancer because even if you have HPV in your throat, it clears, most people clear it. And so it's not going to progress to, to cancer, um, especially if you have a healthier immune system. So most testing for men is done by visual uh, inspection. I have a um, one man whose partner has HPV and um, his partner has a penis. And I have done anal HPV testing. I have done a swab. It's incredibly uncomfortable. It's really, it's way more uncomfortable than it is doing it on the cervix. But if because of that positive exposure, I sometimes do do HPV testing on, on, certain peop, on certain people with penises, not on their penis, usually on their rectum, on their anal tissue. But this is a big question. You know, I, I've heard people talk about like, oh, they just don't want to do it on men or what, you know, they just don't want to do a test on it. And, and I, I, I really, 
I did some research on them. Like, really, is that the truth? Um, I know there's a lot of sexism in medicine. I'm, co I'm confronted with it all the time. And I just have not been able to find anything that supports that. It, it feels a little bit conspiratorial and not the truth. So what do we do? This is a big, big, big issue. How do we disclose? How do we protect ourselves? Like, wow. Um, so, and there's no guidance on this either. I actually, I was like, oh, do you disclose an infection you had 20 years ago? And I, well, what I say is like, you definitely should disclose any new or recent infection. So if your partner just came back with an abnormal pap smear in HPV, yes, it's important to tell, to tell that to your partner. It's important to tell everybody that you may be having contact with that you have this exposure. Um, so I remember being always asking like, oh, have you had a partner with an abnormal pap test and what did they do about it? So an abnormal pap test with a positive HPV, because you could have abnormal pap tests without a positive HPV. You could have it because of infection or inflammation. So a couple of questions I have. Um, if the virus is not cleared by age 43, will it ever? Yes. And sometimes it's not that the virus hasn't cleared, it's that you might be reinfected with a new virus. So a lot of times it's a reinfection versus a not clearing. But some people, yeah, and, and sometimes, you know, because of immune immunity or just being one of those outliers, um, I've seen HPV that has been more challenging to get rid of, but it's 90% of the time it clears within two years. So if you pass the HPV to a partner, can they pass the same strain back to you? No, because, but there's 150 strains. So if you pass, let's say you have 13, you give your partner 13, they have 13. Both of you are probably gonna clear it. Now, later on down the line, could you get 13 again? Maybe. Could your partner give you 13? If you're both at the same time, no, you both have it. And if you have HPV, you could pretty much assume that you passed it to your partner. I mean, that is true, but we have to keep it in context. Most of it clears and most of it doesn't cause any problems. So if it's really concerning, for example, if you're really somebody who's like, I want to never give anything to anybody, then you could wait eight to 20 months, you know, before you have any intimate contact. And I'm talking about any intimate contact. I'm not just talking about penetrative contact because HPV is a skin to skin and mucosal to skin infection. So even using condoms only protects the inside of the canal, unless you use an internal condom that has a wide sheath that covers the entire vulva area. But most, you know, you can get it just from genital general contact. So uh, people with vulvas who have sex with people with vulvas have passed HPV, have passed HPV into the cervixes through toys and fingers and all of the, all the things. Um, a lot of times it, it needs some mucosal surface, which is why it could get into the throat and mouth. Dry humping, um, underwear to skin, that's okay because you're covered. So if you're doing outer course, and if you're doing covered outer course, then it's really gonna be hard to pass HPV to, to one another. I like that term, outer course. So one of the things to really help is discuss vaccinations. Like, hey, have you been vaccinated? And I'll talk a little bit about vaccinations in a moment. Um, and getting vaccinated, because then you actually protect yourself against the most virulent types. You protect yourself against 16, 18, and the kind a few others, there's nine, nine strains and two of those also protect you against genital warts. So how about even when fabrics go wet? Yeah, I think that that, I, you know, there's theoretical, um, there's a theoret theoretically, you could pass the virus through like muse, moist, um, oh, what, there's a name for it, through, through wet clothes and moisture but there's never been a actual confirmed case of that. And I look that up. Um, I, I, yeah, there's never been a confirmed case of it being passed through fomites, it's called fomites. 
through like sitting on, on something that may have HPV or through wet clothes. It's usually skin to skin contact. It's not usually, it's skin to skin contact. So how about testing? Uh, should you test more often? Like, hey, I want to test every single year because I want to make sure I don't have it. Well, yes, but again, what are you going to do with that information? And most insurances are not going to cover that unless there's an abnormality. I mean, yes, people can go out and get and pay for uh, pap testing of a cervix, but it's uncomfortable and it's not really necessary. Most infections clear within two years. And if you had a past infection, like 20 years ago or 16 years ago or five years ago and you've had pap smears that are, are now normal, then you no longer have an active infection. Should you disclose about your past infections? Sure, I think talking about your sexual health in all the ways is really, really important. And talking about your sexual health just increases your ability to communicate about all the things. So yeah, I think it's not strictly necessary, but it is something helpful and I do recommend it. Okay, HPV vaccines. Now this is the solution to ending HPV, you know? I know that there's a lot of thoughts like, oh, uh, let's not do vaccines and vaccines are, are not good for you. But we started vaccinating in 2006. So the data is really limited in how effective it is because if 2006 has been 15 years. So let's say we started vaccinating third, you know, 11 year olds back then, and not everybody was vaccinated. There was, and it was only the vaccination was only brought out for, for people with cervixes at that point. So at that point, so there's not a lot of people to actually study, but in Australia where they have been vaccinating a little bit more aggressively than we have here, there has been a notable decrease in the rates of HPV. We start uh, with primary prevention at age 11 or 12. And you go as young as nine. And you know what? I used to actually recommend waiting because I thought, well, I don't know when the vaccine wanes. And if we know it's good for 10 years, and since most people become sexually active somewhere after the age of 15, isn't vaccinating 11 year olds a little too young? Because what if it wanes by the time they're 25? This was my thinking. And I did some research on that. And I found that actually by vaccinating at 11 and 12, they develop a way stronger immune, uh, immune response to the vaccine. So it's better to vaccinate younger. You also only need two shots before the age of 14, three shots after the age of 14. So if somebody has not been vaccinated, you can do this, what we call secondary prevention and do some catch up vaccines up until the age of 26. So anybody below 26, if they had one shot or two shots, you know, we kind of complete their series and try to get everybody caught up by 26. But again, remember that most HPV infections occur between the ages of 20 and 24. Catch-up vaccines are not recommended for all adults over the age of 26. And we have something in medicine that we call shared decision-making means that you and your doctor kind of discuss, you and your healthcare provider discuss, do, should I get the vaccine? And I'm over 27. In fact, I'm 42, should I get the vaccine? And really it depends on whether or not you're at risk for it. If you are a happily monogamous person who's been in a monogamous relationship for the past 20 years and you're going to be in a monogamous relationship for the next 20 years I mean not that you know but it seems like that then no you probably don't need the HV vaccine if you are somebody who is a serial monogamist or somebody who has uh, who is non-monogamous then yeah I would say that getting the vaccine up till the age of 45 is something that I would recommend and I do discuss this with all my patients even if they've had a history of HPV. So if you've had HPV, what good is the vaccine? Well, it protects you against those other strains that you might not have been exposed to. It doesn't help prevent the ones that you have. Like if you had 16 and you get the, the vaccine, it doesn't make it better. You have to go through everything else, the, either watching it clear or treating it. But it does improve um, that'll prevent you from getting 18 and all the other ones. There are no risks of vaccinating over 26. 
no increased risks at all. No, no, there's no risk that if an 11 and 12 year old can handle it with their immune system, the, there's no risk of vaccinating over 26. The biggest hold up with it is whether or not your insurance will cover it. It is FDA approved and your insurance should cover it, but sometimes insurances are funny with vaccines. And sometimes even though they're approved because it doesn't fit into the primary prevention, it may not cover it. So your provider can give it to you, but your insurance may not pay for it. So that means it, it's expensive. It's about $600. Is it worth it? That's up to you. That's up to you. So they're effective. 98% of the people develop an antibody reaction, an antibody response to it. And so far, again, because it's only been out for 15 years, they have found that they remain 90% effective after 10 to 12 years after immunization. Um, and then what's the risk of a person with infection passing it on who's vaccinated it you know you could pass it yes if you have an infection you could absolutely pass it to the person who's been vaccinated but that person who's been vaccinated is not going it's going to be able to fight the, the virus and then will not have it in their bodies to pass it on to anybody else so could a vaccine no a vaccine you a vaccinated person could not pass it to someone else that's the beauty of it so th that's why we vaccinate both you know, people with penises and people with cervixes now. It used to just be cervixes because they're the ones who got the cancer, but now we're noting the throat and the fact that if we vaccinate everybody, then we're going to really eradicate this virus. And it, what if you've been celibate for several years and just found out you had an HPV strain? Why hasn't it cleared? Um, that's a really excellent question. And that could be to your immune system. And so sometimes, and I think I said this a little earlier, that some clearing doesn't mean that it's cured. So clearing, the DNA will always be in the cells, but most of the, you know, when it's cleared, it doesn't, it's not transmissible to anybody. But there are times when that clearance doesn't necessarily happen for a variety of reasons. Either it's a very aggressive strain or your immune system just has not been able to fight it. And I think I'm going to talk about immune system in a minute and we'll kind of get back to that. So within a decade of, of this, of the four, uh, the Gardasil 4, which only covered four strains, these four strains, now we cover nine strains. Uh, there is a 78% decrease of these types in ages 14 to 24. So we know that the vaccine's effective. Are barriers effective? I mentioned this earlier, barriers are only effective in the places that they cover. So, and this is true also for herpes. You know, sometimes I realize that in a lot of STI um, conversations that we have, the two ways of decreasing STIs is condoms and uh, mutual monogamy. And the truth is, is that condoms don't work all that great for some infections. They do for HIV, <clears throat> they do for chlamydia and gonorrhea. <coughs> but for, for genital, you know, genital warts, they don't. And for herpes, they don't. They do some, they do some, about 50 to 80%. So now it's this immune system, you know, what there, there's this idea, I don't know, there's the germ theory and the terrain theory. Germ theory, which is what most of us um, have been brought up knowing, is like when you get infected by a germ, then that germ takes over your body and causes disease. The terrain theory says that if you have a really strong body and your terrain is, is strong, then that infection will not take hold and will not cause disease. They're both right and they're both wrong. The truth is it's both things, it's both things. We need to have a strong terrain and yet we also will get exposed to infections. One of the things that we have learned this past year, which with COVID is that you, a lot depends on your viral load. 
as well. So if you get a lot of the virus, then it might be overwhelming for your immune system. So maybe when you got this HPD strain 18, you just got a big dose, you got a lot of exposure to it so that your body hasn't been able to like get on top of it and, and remove it. And I, I have some questions like, did they treat this? Have, has your HPV been, uh, has, is it on your cervix? Has it been frozen? Have you had a leap procedure? Have they done anything to actually try to remove this strain? I'm curious about that question, so. So how do you can, and a healthy immune system, I think you all know this, you know, you eat healthy, you eat the rainbow, you reduce your stress, smoking, smoking is really linked to HPV infections, like persistent HPV infections in precancerous lesions. So is stress. And then I really always believe that we need to remember about pleasure and pleasure is everything. That's why I pick a picture of a cat, you know, pleasure is just petting a cat or feeling like you could purr. So really working at keeping that terrain strong is very critical. Okay, now I'm gonna go into a little bit of my talk about risk tolerance. This is one of my favorite things to talk about when we talk about STIs, because I talked to you about HPV. And what we know about it is that it's really common. It's really prevalent. Everybody gets exposed to it at some time of their life, at least one of the strains. And yet we also know that the, it can cause serious disease and we, don't, we wanna be cautious about that. We don't wanna say, oh, it's nothing. So where do we lie in our tolerance of getting infections? So I have kind of, I have created this idea that tolerance is a scale and it goes from low tolerance to high tolerance. And on one end is being very risk averse and the other one is being very risk complacent. And I think of it with like a backpack and or a survival kit. When you have really low tolerance, you have a lot of stuff in your survival kit. You really don't want to get caught in that storm. You don't want to get caught. You might not even climb the mountain, but if you do, you're going to have all the things that you need. Or you may just want to fly up the mountain so you could fly down and you're certain nothing's going to happen to you and you just don't take even water or jacket or anything. You just go. And that could be a little bit too complacent. So understanding that there is this, this tolerance that we have to consider and where we're at in the tolerance and how we're going to then communicate to our partners about this, because this is very important. If you're somebody who is really high tolerant and it's like, oh, I don't care about this, with somebody who's very low tolerant, without communicating this to each other a lot, it could really lead to some really unhealthy um, dynamics. Okay, no person for the strain, just found out with my last pap smear. Okay, I will come back to you and talk a little bit about that in a moment. Okay. So what is in, what creates this tolerance? What creates what we put in our survival kit? Because we all, we could be on any place in the scale at different times. And this is not just HPV. This is actually, I started thinking about this with herpes and then I applied it to COVID because as we know with COVID, some people have really low tolerance and they're sick. They, they have bad immune systems, they have illnesses. And then there's people who are like, hey, I'm gonna party in Fort Lauderdale this weekend. So we need to figure out like where we're at so we could kind of find our people and our niche. And so what creates that? What creates those tolerances? Sometimes we, and it's our history of trauma. It's fear of judgment. Oh my God, if I get this disease, it's gonna, people are gonna be so mad at me. I, I read an article recently about um, somebody who had COVID in Canada and said he had COVID and then everybody started shaming them. So, you know, there's a lot of shame associated with getting an infection. There's lack of access to medical care. If you can't see a doctor, then yeah, you, you're gonna have a much, you're gonna have a lot more things in, in the survival kit to protect you. Then what causes it to be too low? Sometimes it could be because you're drinking and you don't think about things and you don't have a conversation. Sometimes you have a really good community support and you know that no matter what happens, you're gonna get through it. So you're not so worried about it. Some people just don't care. 
Um, some people like they, their partner really understands their disease and could communicate it. And so that kind of helps someone feel like, okay, I could, I could take a little bit more of a risk and I could tolerate a little bit more. Why is this important to know? Because sometimes we don't realize the things that we carry to keep us safe. And some of those things absolutely serve us and we need it. We need that water. We need those blankets in case we get caught in the storm. But some things don't serve us. Like we don't need to get all the, pick up all those rocks that we find that are pretty and put them in our backpack and make it heavier for us to actually move through life. So I really encourage everybody, no matter where you're at on that risk tolerance, whether it's for COVID or herpes or HPV or influenza, anything with an infection, really to look at it and say, what is it in me that I have this level of risk tolerance where I can, is it because, wow, I have a polycule and there's somebody in this polycule that, you know, has no access to medical care. And if they were to get HPV, that could be really damaging for them. So we all have to kind of take care of that. Or is it because, oh my gosh, I have so much trauma of having somebody put any instruments inside of my canal. And, and that's a real thing. That's a really real thing. There's a lot of medical trauma that people make it difficult for them to go through something. So that may make them have very low tolerance. Um, does this make sense? I kind of want a little bit of feedback of your thoughts on this. If anybody has thoughts on this. <laughs> I think it makes a lot of sense, Evelyn. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. So this is kind of, this framework I find really important and it's so important so that we can actually take ownership over our shame and over the stigma. Because without doing that, we allow our culture and others to kind of keep us trapped in a box of fear. Not that the fear is not warranted, it is warranted, but it doesn't always, I mean, if you, if everybody could kind of recall what it was like last April, damn, we were scared. I, I, I came up with this tolerance, I actually published it and it got, um, and it got a lot of press. It was probably the most viral thing I ever created. And really it was about the fact that like some people just if you're in new york city in april you're going to have really damn low tolerance but if you're living out in the country in in eastern oregon then you know you might not care as much and still go to church and without having this understanding we can't have conversations and conversations i think are the key to getting rid of of uh, stigma so why are they the key to getting rid of stigma? Why are they the key to kind of reducing? I, I have this hypothesis that if we actually start understanding our risk tolerance and communicating with each other about our needs and our history, and then we'll actually maybe get tested more, and then we'll actually reduce STI transmission, all of it. I don't think that the answer is that condoms and monogamy are the only answer. Because we know as human beings, that condoms and monogamy do not work all the time. <laughs> I'm gonna just say that, you know, the rate of people having extramarital affairs, the rate of people not using condoms. I mean, I have a, I have a two 20 year old, young 20 year old children and um, I talk to them, you know, I talk to them like, hey, what's condom like? You guys use condoms. And they're like, the only reason we use condoms is we're scared of pregnancy. We don't even think about STIs. I'm like, oh my God, really? I'm your mother. How could you not think about STIs? I mean, they do, but I think it just in this, in a younger age group, we, the sex education has not really informed us that we have the ownership over our bodies and that we can actually declare what we want and need. So I created a framework to have a conversation that I think is really helpful and, and important. And it's called STARS and it stands for your STI status. And you ask me, hey, I was, you start with yourself. Like I was last tested in, in April and I was tested for gonorrhea, chlamydia, HIV, syphilis, and I was negative. 
never use the word clean. I was negative. I had my last pap smear two years ago and my pap smear came back negative and I did not show up with any HPV. <laughs> Just one of the biggest faux pas is saying that it's clean because the opposite of clean is dirty. And I don't know, some people actually like a little dirty sex. So, you know, let's stay away from judgment. So the other part is just asking about sexual health. Let's normalize our conversations around our sexuality. It's something that we all in some ways have this energetic, even if you're asexual, even if you're celibate. I believe that there's, there's health, re, health issues that can occur amongst all body types around our sexual health. And we talk about our mental health. We talk about our physical health. Well, we should include sexual health in there too. And then the other parts of the conversation are your turn-ons. What is it that you like? What makes you feel good? What do you desire? What do you like to play with? And then there's the avoids and that's boundaries. Damn, we do not teach people boundaries and how to communicate boundaries. And boundaries are what keeps relationships healthy. They're that space between me and you and that space where we but without boundaries and there's no space between me and you and wow it can get really messy so what are the things that you want to avoid or what are your limits relationship intentions you know this is who i am and this is what i want and i want to have a hookup or i want to have a relationship or i want monogamy or i'm polyamorous or whatever oh just disclosure is such a beautiful thing and what does intimacy mean if we were to be sexual together what does that mean what if something was to happen? Like what if we, one of us was to get an STI? How would we handle that? And that's part of the safer sex etiquette. It's not just about using barriers in pregnancy. That's part of it. But it's about how do we create safety together? What is our risk tolerance together? How can we all make each other feel alive and vital and just have fun so that we're not actually carrying these stories of shame about what we do that bring us, us pleasure? And any questions about that? Okay, so that's the end of my slideshow. Well, I took a bit of time and I'm gonna send this out to everybody um, who signed up, whether you showed up here or not. Um, I do have one other class planned and this one I'm pretty excited about. It's gonna be talking about STIs for the context of people who are poly, uh, non-monogamous, kinky and queer because so much of what the ways that we talk about STIs really have this heteronormative, cisgendered approach, all the research is that way. So what if you don't, what if monogamy isn't what is your answer? What if you have, you don't wanna define the genitals of what you play with or who you are? Or what if you're not even having any sex and instead you're doing other sorts of play? How do we actually figure out ways of decreasing transmission of herpes, of HPV, of all the infections in those contexts? So I am gonna be teaching a class on, it's gonna be a Sunday morning because I'm hoping to get people in different time zones to be able to attend. I am going to write a handbook on this in particular too in the future. So just keep an eye on that. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen in a moment. This is how you could follow me. I am on Instagram at, at sexmeddoc. I am on Facebook at my name, Evelyn Dacker. I have two websites. One is Make Time for the Talk, and that's about stars. Um, I do teach workshops on stars where I get a bunch of people together and we actually do breakout groups and you actually practice doing the talk. I have scripts for people. I don't have any class scheduled in the future. Um, I'm trying to take it one month at a time, but I will have a class probably in April. It's fun. It's a little edgy. You have to be ready to actually like say stuff to people that you may not know, but that's how you practice it and that's how you get good at it. And then my, my website, evelynedacker.com, which I have everything on. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop the recording so that we could have a conversation. Okay.